even understanding yourself, right? The assessment helps you understand yourself. And if everybody's doing that, then kind of knowing, okay, I'm this way, you're that way, and kind of understanding how to communicate, how to provide what each other means and understand why people might act a certain way or feel a certain way or whatever that may be, meaning withdraw or be anxious or be stressed or whatever. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Finding the Upside. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm in the studio today, and I have with me virtually Mandy Keene, who has been on before, and she is with me tonight. I'm so excited for her to join me. Hey, Mandy. Hi, Marie. I'm so happy to be here with you. Yeah. Uh, We are tonight going to talk about assessments and understand.me. We've talked about this before, but I uh, wanted to discuss it at a deeper level uh, from a different angle. And I'm going to let Mandy just briefly kind of intro herself. I'm going to give a brief intro. Mandy is a coach. She has been coaching for 24 years now? Five now. (laughs) <laughs> 25. Wow. And she is an expert in assessments, assessments like DISC and Enneagram and Strengths Finders and 16 Personalities. And she is at the forefront of a platform that's been created called Understand.me that helps people be able to access the assessments and see them all on one platform so they can compare them, contrast them, and share with other team members, other people in their life. Um, and it's an amazing platform that that I've used and I use not only with my team, but some of my clients as well. And we're going to talk today about using assessments and understand.me to help with team dynamics. And yeah, we're talking about companies, but really that could be any team. That could be any group of people that come together for any purpose of work or volunteering or families or whatever. So Mandy, you want to just take it from there and give us a little bit more background? Yes. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for having me. I love this conversation. I was also going to say, you know, I go on uh, girls trips every um, twice a year and uh, I've even used it with my girlfriends, you know, and and understanding each other better. Cause like when you're planning trips and how you're all different with what you need when you go on a trip together. And it's it's so important with like friendships as well. Um, So I find that there really isn't a place that I haven't benefited from this knowledge. I'm just thrilled to be able to share it. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And to, and also on that note, you know, we've talked about this, of course, so many times, but even understanding yourself, right? The assessment helps you understand yourself. And if everybody's doing that, then kind of knowing, okay, I'm this way, you're that way, and kind of understanding how to communicate, how to provide what each other means, and understand why people might act a certain way, or feel a certain way, or whatever that may be, meaning withdraw, or be anxious, or be stressed, or whatever. So I'm super excited to dive into this. Tell me just generally, and we'll get deeper into this, in your experience in working with assessments or giving assessments with people inside of a team, tell me a little bit about that and how that's different or even adds more benefits than just understanding ourselves. Just talk a little bit about what people gain from that. If you want to give examples um, or just you know, broad uh, insights, areas of insights that that can help um, in working with teams? Well, you know, you you make me think way back, Maria, you're making me go way back to the good old days. <laughs> uh, I remember my very first exposure to my first assessment was DISC. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was through Tony Robbins. And I was at a Tony Robbins coach training Mm -hmm. And it was by a brilliant man by the name of Robert Alderman. And he had 
uh, all of Tony's employees take the DISC assessment. And I'll always remember this huge mind map that was up on Anthony Robbins company's wall. Mm. And, you know, not very many people knew that the, um, the company was just chaos, you know, <laughs> and just like all the stress that mm -hmm. um, the staff and everybody went through just to keep that company going. And what was so insightful, and I, I'm grateful that Tony was willing to see it and make changes, is on disc, Tony is a 99D and a 99I. And he, you know, we tend to hire as business owners, business owners tend to hire people like them because it's mm -hmm. human nature. I always tell my clients, we tend to like people who are like us, yeah. you know, like attracts like, you know, yeah. says, like, opposites attract. Yes, they do sometimes in like romantic partnerships. But when it comes to like team building, you know, did you ever have, I have some trauma from this, <laughs> like remember in school when like, like they picked with the relays, like I'm yes. the yeah, on my team, like I was always like last picked, mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the kids always picked the kids that they liked, right? The kids that were like them. Mm -hmm. And so Tony and his company, it was all high D, high I heavy. So it was like primarily people who were really good at sales and marketing, but no one was really good at the systems and the organization and the details. And Robert Alderman was like, I don't know how you guys are functioning. <laughs> and that was like my first exposure to, oh, and Robert explained that you need all types to make a company work and really where um, everybody fits. And the most beautiful thing that I've discovered in really studying all these assessments and getting to know people is wherever, wherever we're the happiest, Maria, this is my favorite truth, is wherever we're the happiest is also where we are, where we shine the most and where we're the most valued. Like they both fit. Yeah. So it's like, if you're not, I always tell a client or someone who, you know, has a friend or knows someone who's like, hates their job or hates what they're doing. There's actually something better for you where you're going to find more fulfillment that nature has designed for you, that you're, you're designed to do that. You're actually that on our planet, you, we actually need you to do that more than what you're doing that you hate. Like you're not yeah. supposed to, that's not how we're wired. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I've also recently uh, been, you know, obviously I've used assessments in and have been exposed to them at an early time, even before I knew you back in a company, they were pretty forward thinking and they gave us all disc assessments and explained it all. And we kind of compared and contrasted and it was very insightful, but more so with it, with a team understanding the natural strengths and matches of what people are good at, like you were just saying, can be so transformative inside a team. And also, as you said, for a person, because when people feel like they are doing stuff that they're not thriving, they're struggling, many times it is because they're not matched to the task or the role appropriately, right? And I can even experience that. Like, why is this so hard for me? You know, why is this so hard for me? It's hard for me because it doesn't fall in with my natural strengths. And what I've recently, you know, been working with a team that they've done this, they've assessed this, they had some enlightened moments where they're like, huh, no wonder why this is so hard for Jane. Or, oh, no wonder why this is so hard for so-and-so. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can't do it, but it's going to take them longer. It's going to cause more stress, like whatever that task is. So being able to match people in the roles and in the style and, and with work that's matched to that, I think can, and in this case, can transform not only the people, but the team and then the results. Because it's so simple. If you think about like a baseball team, you know, a pitcher shouldn't be catching. Yeah. Right. And 
and somebody in the outfield who's like good at the outfield shouldn't be, you know, uh, I don't know, third base or whatever, but you yeah. get the point. Yeah. So I think that's one of the biggest benefits is being able to do that. And I think inside traditional corporations, sometimes we're afraid to do that as leaders, because what if we've matched people to the wrong thing? Right. And then they think, oh, we hired the wrong person. Not necessarily. Maybe we just need to do some shifting to match them appropriately to what is a natural fit. I don't know. Well, I think that there's what I have learned is and I know I know I, I might spark some fire here with my Maria. So feel free to mm -hmm. fire up is is I do believe there needs to go, there needs to be a value system with the company to first realize the, the, to value the employees being in the right seat on the bus. Absolutely. And, and it takes what I've learned in, in coaching people on this, Maria, because whenever I get a client who just wants me to bada bing, bada boom, tell me what tell me what assessment I should look for, for this role. I'm like, it doesn't, it's not black and white. Like this is a human being. This is not right. a robot. Right. Right. And now we're, especially with what's happening with AI, the, the leadership that I see that is going to be cultivated and the leadership that I see that that is starving for is leaders who are actually curious about their staff and people and who actually value something that goes well beyond profits, dare I say. 100%. And, <laughs> and actually want to create more of a legacy and see beyond. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you, you know, you know what's going to happen, but you see beyond creating just profits you want to create a legacy you want to have that ripple effect for um humanity mm -hmm. and those are the people who are going to value okay i want to make sure like it's a sacred experience to have another human being right working with you just like it's right. a sacred experience i think it's a sacred experience to call someone a friend to get into a relationship right. and so that's a very different mindset it's a very different value system than someone and I'm not, I'm not saying that to be self-righteous or to be judgmental, but it's just a very different value system. So someone who values that is going to be more curious and is going to put in more time and energy in studying people than yeah. someone that just wants to bada bing, bada boom, who should I hire? Well, you know, you're speaking my language here. And so I'm curious when you said you might get me fired up, you don't mean at what you're saying. You mean because, you know, I feel the same way. Right. Yes. And um, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think also what's interesting about you mentioning AI, like this has been in leadership and, and in and in. Uh, corporate uh, business culture for a long time, people have been bucking the non-human way. And you know, that's like what I preach, right? you know, being a rebel and going against corporate think and bringing humanity back into business. Because I believe, and it's proven that you can have a impact on people and value humanity and you can still make money. <laughs> they are not mutually exclusive. They're not one or the other. And not only that, but as you said, the people who are interested in the, the ability to impact humans, have an impact, leave a legacy on this world, this planet that we have, rather than just make a whole bunch of dough, you know? And so... Yeah, assessments are so tied into that, but you're you're right. They're they're the value is in the people who recognize just let's put an assessment in place. I think I think a lot of leaders and business owners have been approaching assessments and tell me if I'm wrong with a very narrow view. So like they heard, you know, you're supposed to do assessments to hire and that's how I'm going to get the slam dunk. I know I'm going to get the right hire and they're going to match what I'm looking for. A lot of leaders and business owners approach assessments that way. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's, I would say there are like 
if I had to, if I had to overgeneralize, there's like two main like buckets. There's the, just this very stressed out business owner that is very self-involved and it's not necessarily Mm -hmm. a bad person. It's just that they're, you know, you know that whenever you're in, whenever you're stressed, whenever you're in panic mode, you can't help but think about yourself. Yeah. I always, I like to use the the dramatic example of like, if you're, if your leg is caught in a bear trap, you're going to be thinking about your leg in the bear trap. You're not going to be thinking about much else. And there's, I find right now that there's so many really stressed out business owners and, and it's, it's a lot of what's going on between their ears and they are wanting to just, just tell me, just tell me, just tell me who I should, just tell me, just tell me, just tell me the, 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 yeah. Right. Then I, I, I do have, um, uh, a few gems of clients like yourself (laughs) who really, um, cultivate, uh, getting to know who their staff is, who their team is. Like, it's so interesting. My, my niece, Kendall, I actually started working with her boss because I start, I, I was like, wow, he's really paying attention to you. And he started studying Enneagram because, you know, Kendall is a four mm-hmm. and he understood that she was a four. He knew, he knew about her being an Enneagram four. He knew about her, her disc. He knew about mm-hmm. um, her health issues. Like, he knew and and he met her from Upwork and hired her on Upwork and he got to know her so well. And it's so funny because she actually got another job offer that was more money, but she said, no, I'm not going to leave him. Mm-hmm. And there's this loyalty and every, you, mm-hmm. and you don't know how many times I've had my other clients where they're like, no one's loyal. They all, you know, and it's like, but, but are you getting, are you putting in the investment? Are you getting to know them? Are you putting in the heart and the care? And it's, it's hard. I'm finding that just like anything else, it's hard to, to, to teach that verbally. I find that life needs to be the teacher and experience, Mm -hmm. but I do find that The people who are hungry and curious about assessments, the ones that are willing to roll up their sleeves and and to learn this and to uh, master it, it is such a gift because you, like you said, you become, uh, like, I don't take things personally anymore. You know, with the four agreements, don't take things personally. I used to take mm-hmm. everything personally. Oh, you mm-hmm. didn't call me back. Why didn't you call me back? Do they hate me? You know, like just so, so sensitive. And after I studied myself and I understood myself on a deeper level and I understood other personalities, I'm, I was able to connect the dots. It wasn't yeah. just like willpower. Don't take things personally. I was yeah. able to have compassion for myself and for other people. And so there, there's a lot of freedom when you have this knowledge and awareness. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, is like, as you're saying, like that about a leader being self-aware and knowing themselves is essential, is essential to be a great leader. It's essential. So it's such a natural fit that I'm understanding myself. Now let me allow my team members to understand themselves. And then we all understand our differences, our strengths, our similarities, how we react, all of that, and utilizing that to create better communication, better team cohesion, better, you know, I mean, and actually a better culture as well, because as you said, if you understand that what somebody needs, you're not going to react when they withdraw, you're going to know she does that because, and then know what to give her, right? And not just as a team member, right? A coworker, but as a leader as well. It just, it's kind of like, it, it, it's, it seems like so simple because how would you expect to have a life partner, for example, without getting to know them at a deep level? 
how would you expect to do that? And when you mentioned loyalty before, right, with Kendall, getting to know someone and providing a safe environment and giving them what they need, then that's reciprocated back through loyalty, which hello, business leaders, hello, companies, that's what you're looking for. So it's like companies have been starving for loyalty and commitment and team members and people who are working are starving for support, concern, and you wash my hand, I'll wash yours. Like, I, I, I mean, one hand washes the other. I don't know why we make it so complicated in business. Like, why is that elusive to so many people understanding that? Because, you know, I mean, we're going kind of tangent here, but I've always said this, you work hard for somebody you feel gives a crap about you. You're not going to work hard for somebody who, you know, if they don't make their numbers, your history, right? So the only way that happens is to really invest, not just in that person from a training level or all the things that business talks about. It's actually getting to know them and providing for them and supporting them and vice versa, right? It's that dynamic. It really is that give and take. And I, I will t- I will share with you, unfortunately, there are people in abusive work situations and the reason why they stay and the reason why so many people, uh, you know, stay in that dynamic and why uh, leader, so many leaders are unaware and why, even though it is, it's so obvious to us. And it is, you're right, it is so simple, it's silly. But if I were to put one word to it, it's it's trauma. Yeah. Trauma. Yeah. And and that's where, you know, um, I love those like Instagram memes where someone says, like, oh, you're so funny. And and they go, Oh, thanks. It's it's my trauma, <laughs> you know. And that's <laughs> something that um I also love about assessments when people say, Oh, Mandy, you know, I don't want to be put into a box or you know, I know that I'm not my personality. I'm absolutely, you're not just like, you're not your body. You're an internal soul. Understanding your personality is understanding who you had to become because of what you went through in your Mm -hmm. childhood. And -hmm. when you understand your personality and how you had to cope, that's how you grow. So it's actually becoming more aware of how you've coped so that you can grow and expand. Yeah. Being unaware is being stuck in a box. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, obviously there's so much self uh, gain as well, but if we all individually get to know self, then that just automatically is going to help all the people who are working side by side together um, and really can unlock some other things for people. So I think not only just from a work environment standpoint, but having an impact and giving this to people to allow them to understand more about themselves, to grow and to learn and creating that, this is the other thing, creating that environment that introduces this to them, not like we're going to check a box and everybody's going to take this assessment, that really supports it, explains it, lives it, you know, um, and helps people beyond just, okay, this is what you are, but also I could think that's another thing, what you said earlier, none are bad. There's no type that's bad. There's no, oh, I wish I were that. That's the cool one to be. No, there is none of that. And being able for Pete to set that tone for people to understand that I think is such a gift for every individual, but also collectively together, because it's all then creating this team unity and this shared experience that has a dramatic impact on all the people that come and spend so much time together every day, working side by side. So, Uh, right? 
when I hear you talk, I could hear, I could hear your strength of connectedness as I hear you yeah. talk, Maria. And I, and I love it. And you're absolutely right. You know, I like to say that we're, we, each of us are, have an archetype of some, of a type of superhero. Each of mm -hmm. us have an archetype of an incredible talent and no one is left out. No one. Yeah. And, and it's about uncovering that and it's about discovering that. And it's about also finding the best environment. And I actually have a lot of hope and faith in our younger generation. Um, they, uh, they've seen a lot of BS and they're not mm -hmm. putting up with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they do have more of a rebellion. Um, and I do, I see, I see them demanding more of an emotional intelligence and more of a psychology of safety in yeah. the work environment. I think it is going to be an extremely, and it is happening right now, an extremely uncomfortable transition to get there. But yeah. uh, I do believe assessments can be a really powerful tool for, for, for all sides, for some of the people who are kind of old school and stuck and, and the new generation. Agreed. And I mean, in the work that I do and, 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 you know, you know, this and probably everybody listening who listens to this podcast knows this too. I take a very rebellious approach. I mean, rebel leadership, that's my mantra. Um, and it's only starting all those thoughts that thought leadership um, or that the thought leadership on leadership, this different kind of leadership and this different approach has been trying to get traction for so long and it is having traction. And I agree with you. I think that the younger generation is going to push it over the top. That's what I think is going to happen because it has been this attitude. And I mean, you know, my whole story talks about, you know, how, being the leading the way that I ha led my whole career was anti what was modeled for me and not celebrated. Right. Yeah. And many people that I've talked to who share the same uh, ideals as me on leadership and what works. Uh, we've talked about this and, and shared our kind of stories, but it started to build right through really through the pandemic. I mean, that was the first pushback period where people are like, we're not taking this anymore you know, um, and companies started to struggle with getting people. They always struggled with getting people, but people to stay. Right. And, you know, we could talk all night about why there's been an evolution of that, of the reasons why, but especially in this day and age with the overwhelming profitability that companies have, if they don't continue, if they continue in that mantra of, people over, pro, you know, profits over people, the numbers first, the numbers first, the shareholders first, I get it. But where will that get you if you don't have people? And everybody can talk about AI and all of that, but you're going to still need humans. I mean, we're kidding ourselves if we think robots are going to do it all. They're not. And everybody knows that who, who has given it some thought. So it started to have some traction and now more people are talking about this, but the younger generation, you're right, is not going to stand for it. And that's, what's going to make it, you know, instead of this early adopter thing, like here's this new wave of leadership, it's going to be the norm. That's what I believe, because otherwise you, I don't think P, I don't think companies are going to succeed um, because that's what the, they, labor workforce is demanding. But without that, with all that being said, I think education is key, right? And talking about this, not just the younger generation pushing for it, people like you and I, and people who share the principles, who have seen it work and have proven it works and really showing the way, I think is also an important part of that. Um, and I, I have some questions that I want to tie back to this because, you know, business always is looking for the ROI, right? So we have to draw the lines to that. The ROI is, as we've just said, if people feel supported, like they're part of a community that you've invested in them, that you're, they're, they're, they're being supported in the way they need to be supported 
and can work in the way that they are thriving, set up for success, everybody wins in that equation. Yes. Yeah. So go ahead. That's something that um, it's such a simple, uh, it's such a simple tool that I love teaching managers and leaders that in understand.me, there's all these very advanced, you know, assessments like Enneagram goes yeah. so deep. Like Enneagram yeah. is like, it's so deep. Strengths finder is so deep. Like there's one that's the values. And I always share with my business owners and my managers, whenever you hire someone, get their, like their name and their, their number one and, and, and number two value and memorize it memorize like their name and their and their number two their their number one and their number two values what does and, that do and what that does is when you know what someone's number one and number two values are because usually it's like our top two values is what drives us right. whenever i have a client who is depressed blue or you know the classic thing i hear as a coach is i'm not motivated help me be motivated or mm -hmm. I'm, you know i had a client years ago he's he's still one of my favorite clients he was just such a funny guy he was actually in his 80s and wow. yeah he was like he was like uh my my wife is going to kick me out of the house because <laughs> she's tired of me moping around and he said he said, I got life in me, Mandy, but I, I don't know what to do. I'm just, I'm bored. <laughs> and um, I had him take the disc and the um, values and his number one value was leadership. Mm. And I asked him what he did for a living. And he was an executive of this huge company. And he had led for over like 50 years, thousands of people. So he was so used to being a leader. He was so mm -hmm. used to being in charge of something. And he was driving his wife crazy because he kept like bossing her around. And she's like, oh my gosh. And he was he was getting depressed because he wasn't able to do whatever we value makes us feel alive. Yeah. And we and we assume that everybody values what we value. Mm -hmm. And that's where we just get messed up. And most conflicts are values conflicts. And we can get very self-righteous sometimes because mm -hmm. we think, why don't you value what I value? I mean, a lot of my clients don't understand why I'm not more high utilitarian because I'm not, I don't value um, that ROI as much as they do. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I tell them, it doesn't make me or you better or worse than it takes all types to make the world go round. So yes. with him, I told him, I said, you need to find something that you could lead you know, mm -hmm. to be in charge of. And he's like, I don't know. And I said, you know, if you just got involved in your community, yeah. you know, something. And um, he, he ended up getting involved in his local Kiwanis club. Mm -hmm. And within six months, the guy was the president. Yeah. And he was like, so happy. Cause like yeah. he needed that. And so whatever we value, if we are not meeting it, it's like, it's food for our soul. And so if you want to keep your team happy, you want to keep them, I say, like addicted and loyal to you, you find out what they value and you help them meet that. Meet that. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you just some rapid fire questions here, if you will, and uh, yes. to draw out some of this, um, the benefits of working with assessments. I mean, obviously, there's so much science behind assessments, right? And research and experience shows that understanding our individual differences helps a team uh, be more, uh, better perform better and collaborate better. But can you share any insights or specific tangible uh, things that um, can show how using these tools that are on understand.me impact the team dynamic and improve communication specifically? Yes. So for example, a really simple example is um, high C's really like things done in writing. So if you yeah. ever have like a high C on your team. That's for DISC, right? Yeah, that's for DISC. 
So high C's are very detail oriented. And if you have a high C on your team, they really like to communicate in writing and they usually don't like to be put on the spot. So if you have, if you're, if you're a high D and a low C and you got a high C, let's say in a meeting and you're like, Hey, tell me this, bada bing, bada boom. And you put them on the spot. They're going to be very uncomfortable. But if you could say, Hey, this is what I request. You could go ahead and take your time and email me that mm -hmm. they really like, cause they want to be thorough. They don't like to swing from the hip. You yeah. know, um, something that I've, I've, I've trained, uh, my friend, Russell Brunson, who, you know, who founded and created yes. on me, yes. I, he understands now that I'm a very high S and that us mm -hmm. high S is we, uh, we're the steady eddies and we're resistant to, to change. This is what makes us loyal. It's what makes us really good at doing the same things over and over again. Whereas you low S's like to have that variety. So again, with the team, if you're going to have like a big shift in the, in the company or something that's going to be a sudden change, giving space and making sure the S's are okay. Most companies and most leaders are, they lack, they lack the awareness and they lack the consideration. S's are the glue of every company. In my yeah. disc training, they say, if you want something done, you ask an S to do it. And I would say one of the biggest things that I teach with the disc is you got to make sure S's need to know what's going to happen next. They need to have some sort of idea. Mm -hmm. Even if it's going to change, they need to have some sort of idea and you need to give them the space to be uncomfortable and not to shame them that it's freaking them out a little bit. Not, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, that doesn't mean that they're less than. Right. These are your steady eddies. And so just understanding that, um, I've I've noticed with, with teams who incorporate that to be a, a game changer. That's awesome. I I uh I would and I would concur definitely uh in that being able to understand somebody's MO, you know, and understanding. And this is the other thing that I wanted to say earlier that I forgot is that I think also as assessments and not just for me, but also for others that have utilized them in their companies and in a work environment and team environment. I think that it also is, is when you're first exposed to them inside a team or others are taking it it sometimes is the moment, the first moment, the light bulb goes on that you realize that not everybody thinks like you, <laughs> right? Not everybody thinks like you, not everybody values the same thing as you said earlier, Not every, and we're not all the same. And I mean, I think we kind of know that, but inside an organization, it still takes us by surprise when people don't process the way we do or don't digest information the way we do. And what I was thinking as you were saying that is, you know, in training, right, what I do, or even in public speaking, you, those things about considering all the different ways that people are, are inherent in creating a sound, good training, meaning you got to consider all the ways people digest information. Are they auditory? Are they visual? Are they kinesthetic? Are they this? And yes, that's not assessments per se, but it does take into account that I'm creating something that everyone, it's going to have what everyone needs in it. Public speakers, like great public speakers, as they talk in their speeches, they're hitting all the points for the D's, for the I's, for the S's, for the C's, or all the Enneagram types, all the different ones, because it's mass communication. So it's got to hit all of the points. It's got to hit all of the sweet spots, if you will, to connect with everyone. So, you know, we know that, but now it's like you have all these assessments and all these different ways to know it with all the people that you're, you know, working with that are in your family and knowing that. And I, I have to tell you that years ago when I was doing this at a company, 
someone came up to me and said, oh, at a company I was at before, they took this really seriously. And I'm saying this was 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, where we did these assessments. I don't remember which one it was, but then they created a badge that had everybody's type on it that everybody wore at this like team event that they had because that's where they did it. And then it became part of their, it wasn't like, you know, it, again, it was that the tone was set for this is what we're learning. This every, every type is good. We're going to learn about one another and we're going to learn how to leverage this. And we're going to learn how to work with this and incorporate it into our daily practices. And that was part of it was you had it on a badge. And when you went back to your, um, to their office, the people who worked in the same physical space had it on their nameplate, their type you know, whatever the assessment oh, type was, which it. I thought was brilliant because you can take an assessment and put it away in a draw, right? And that's another part of this is how do we integrate this into the culture and to the daily practices within an organization or a team? Have well, you seen that done well? Do you have insights on that? Well, now, now, now you're inspiring me to do a shameless plug, Maria, okay. <laughs> so, because it is, it is learning a new language and just mm-hmm. like learning a new language, you got to speak it. And that mm-hmm. is one of the reasons why we created understand.me yeah. is to create a community of people to come together and to stay in the conversation. Yeah. So it's like, if people are looking for, if, if your company or if your team's not already doing it. You know, understand.me is a great way where you can come together and where, you know, every Thursday, like I do a hot seat call and then I'm going to be training other coaches to do other hot seat calls and where we are in the conversation around assessments because mm-hmm. um, my friend, Annie Gray, she, she, she told me about a study that, that if you fall out of a conversation about something after 90 days, it's like you start to lose the memory of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, if all you do is just stay in this conversation, you're going to deepen. And I love that you use the word like digest it. It's Mm -hmm. like, because this, this knowledge can't be hurried. And Mm -hmm. whenever I have a client who's like, just, just tell me, just tell me, just tell me what I should get. Just tell me, just, I'm like, you can't, you can't hurt you. We all know what happens when you try to hurry digestion. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not good. It's like, this is like contemplative knowledge and it takes slowing down and staying in that conversation. Because one of my favorite things that you said earlier that I want to reinforce is as leaders, you first need to understand yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's essential. I mean, it's essential. And there are so many people I think that try to skip that step that don't want to accept that. And you know, we've talked about this a lot. Um, And, you know, that's the other part of this is talking about this more and bringing this out and educating people and bringing this to light is letting people understand what it's going to do for you. It's going to do a world. I mean, I've had people who have said, not only did when I take the assessment, I understood how to lead my team better. And I understood my team members better, but it also made me a better husband, wife, partner, because you're learning about yourself. And then it's also giving you kind of a mirror to even if your partner doesn't take it, which I hardly, highly encourage, you can see kind of, oh, I'm this way. I bet you she's X, Y, Z, or he's X, Y, Z, because you're now in this language of understanding how we all different, how we all differ and what the different types are like. So I think it has so much um, benefit just in your life in general, in all of these areas, but it's normalizing the the conversation about it, you know, it's not, oh, just take out the Cosmopolitan magazine or let me get an assessment so I make the right hire. It's self-awareness, learning self, and everyone doing that and building the community to do that. So that's also what I love about what you said about 
why it was built? Because that was one of my questions. What was the what was the inspiration for building Understand Not Me? And I know you said Russell said, oh, it would be so cool to put them all up on one place. But really, in a nutshell, is it that to create that community that then people are all in the conversation and can share their results and see one another's? Talk about that a little bit for me. Yeah, well, I I, I got to do another shameless plug, if I may. Of course. Uh, um, so, you know. I, I, I wrote, I wrote this book for on <laughs> it for personality types like you, Maria, like, look how thin it is. Right. So, <laughs> so because Russell challenged me. He's like, I want you to write about all the assessments in one book. And I'm like, it's going to be like a thousand page book, Russell. And he's like, no, Mandy, I want you to write it for people like me, where I can look at someone's assessment on understand.me and just immediately get like the cliff notes. So yep. not like a deep dive. And so I had to like hold myself back and just do the like this is like the the cliff note versions of each, you know, assessment result. So when you have someone, you know, a friend, a family member, a team member, you know, do it and you want to understand it, you get my book and then Excellent. Um, um, and so, yeah, we wanted to, because I was starting to, um, when Russell started using the disc for hiring, I was like, you've got to use values too. And they started using values. Mm -hmm. And then I told, and then he met a guy named James P. Frill who told him about Myers-Briggs. And so he started using that. And then I said, you've got to use strengths finder as well. They could still be a high D high I, but that doesn't mean that they know how to influence or they're not strategic. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. He was like, okay, we just need to combine this. Like this is you know, like, because and now I have to say, using it in coaching, just like when I looked at your um, profile and I've looked at so yep. many others, now I'm spoiled. Now yeah. I'm like, I've got to have all of it because they all approach and cover different areas that um, it's so beautiful how they can all validate and confirm and you could see patterns in one person and um and it really is eye opening and it's so it's so inspiring to have um people be able to understand themselves on such a deeper level with the yeah. combination of the assessments as well as then having a leader being able to see their team mm -hmm. all in one spot yeah and i mean when and and if those of you who are listening didn't catch that episode i did a uh mandy did a live read of my assessments on, on and my profile on understand that me and what i have to say is and i had previously before we did that and I created my profile, I had also participated in a live event where we did multiple assessments and compared and contrasted them. And understand that me seeing all of it on one screen. And as you said, seeing the patterns and obviously you helped me out to help me understand it. But once you see that and it validates like that word you use validates and confirms, but you also see how each one, it's almost like, how do I describe this? I want a good analogy. It's almost like, you know, all the flavors of the iced tea are great. How could you pick one? Because right. they're all great, right? And they, But they all give you a little something different. It's kind of that way with the assessments, right? And then seeing the, the contrast and the similarity in all of them, it gives you like this multi-dimensional look at your personality instead of just doing one, Ooh, which is I what I love. That. Thank yeah, you. I love that. Look. I love that. Yeah. So I'm excited that there's a book. Is it out and yes. published now? Yes, it's out. Amazing. Yes. Oh, that's a that's an awesome resource. Um, and we're gonna we're going to um put in the show notes information about understand that me and i'm sure on understand that me is the ability to get the book but if not if you could give me a link for that so everybody listening you can follow up afterwards um and check that out i highly encourage you to do that so it's not a shameless plug i think it's a resource it's an important resource that's what it i is, think it is an important resource it is <laughs> right I, i'm very i'm very proud and i 
I, you should be. It took a whole team to write that, you know, even though it's my name on the cover, it, 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 it's a whole team that put that together. Well, and I love the, the concept because it, this can be a lot of information to digest, right? And so having a guide to be able to do that um, it is is invaluable, I think. So I think that was spot on. So yay, can't wait to get it. Um, okay, so I have two last questions for you. First, what is the future of assessments? And particularly in teams, obviously we're talking about that, but what do you, where do you see the future of assessments, like those that are already avail available on understand.me heading? Are there other emerging trends or other innovations that you're excited about in this space? Oh my gosh, yes. So I think that there, I think there's going to be more. I've already um, been exposed to more that I'm investigating that I'm super mm -hmm. excited about. Um, I think that uh, I'm really impressed and in awe, I have to say with, again, this younger generation, because they just, they seem to be more open and curious. Yeah. And so yes. I, I predict that there's going to be, uh, uh, we're going to, we're probably going to be shocked and in awe of what is to come. I, 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 I don't think my mind could even imagine it right now, but I'm excited about it because I believe that we have been, um, so ignorant and numb to who we are. And I think we have, given our power away for so long that it almost doesn't, we don't even know what it feels like to be authentic and to be ourselves. And think about it. It's like, we're, we're having to have keynote speakers talking about being authentic. I think we'll get to a point where we won't even need that as much because it'll tip and we'll have a different conversation. So I predict that there'll be um, even more. Um, I think in order to get there though, what is happening right now is a passion and a hunger um, for this conversation. Um, I see a lot on um, TikTok with, uh, yeah. I would say Enneagram is probably one of the most popular ones. Um, and it really goes deep and it's really beautiful with relationships. Um, so I really love that. And I find that, again, the younger generation is just really wanting to know how to connect on an authentic level. You know, it's interesting you're saying that too, because like we, we, we've said that, right, with the tipping point and then pushing it over, you know, the edge. And I, and I didn't really, it didn't hit me, but it's this link, I think. So it's kind of good and bad, right? It's like people are talking about trauma, which is a good thing, right? And I think the younger generation has more of an appetite for like, um, at the event that, that I had, there was this conversation about burnout and why that is and just all of that. And what came out was there was some feedback that, you know, oh, it's cool now. I think somebody said that it's cool now, like for people to be in therapy. And I had to push back on that. And I was like, I think it's a good thing because in our generation, that wasn't even part of the conversation. That wasn't even normalized. We, we weren't talking about that. And if we did, it was shut down. Yeah. So I wasn't making the connection of that, which could be looked at as a negative, right? All these mental health struggles and this generation like being heavily into there. I think that's a good thing because we're finally talking about it. Yeah. We're finally talking about it. And in talking about it leads to the quest for, I got to know myself. I got to unravel that. So the assessments are a direct link to that. Yeah. You know, obviously therapeutic, other therapeutic stuff as well and things that need to be done for whatever uh, path that person has gone through and unraveling their trauma. But the assessments, I didn't see it like that as it being connected to that influx of we are at a place where people are talking about it. Like, thank God, you know? Yes. Yeah. You know, that's, I think there's just been enough pain where people, yeah. people are willing to 
uh, be yeah. brave with their vulnerability and be brave with their, with their honesty and saying, Hey, you know, yes. what? this hasn't worked. I think we need to try something else. That's right. And, and I find that people who are really resistant to personality assessments tend to be resistant to the truth. They tend to Very be true. to being honest. And that person I, I, I have a lot of compassion for because usually they've built those walls for protection. Yeah. So there's a reason for it. Yeah, there's a reason so, behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's good to have compassion and patience for people who have that. Ah, that's, yeah, 100%. Well, um, one last question to close this out, and it's really just, I want you to reveal it. What is your personal favorite assessment that you find particularly transformative and why? Oh, that's like picking your favorite child, Maria. I know. Oh I know. Gosh. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, I, I, I gotta say that, um, if I had to pick one, like if I was meeting a friend, if I was meeting someone new first, I would actually say Enneagram and I would say Enneagram because it just goes the deepest Mm -hmm. to uh because it's linked to the childhood wound and it really it tells me so much it's just like just give me that number and then that tells me so much mm -hmm. and usually now I'm being able to connect okay if you're like you're an Enneagram seven so it's like I can kind of guess well you're probably this on the disc you're probably this on mm -hmm. the this could be like very a little bit, but if I know their Enneagram, I could kind of have an idea what the other assessments could, you know, the range of the others. So if I had to pick one, but man, that's tough. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Well, I, it's like I said before, kind of like you love all the iced teas, yeah. you know, the iced tea flavors. It's hard to pick just one, but yeah. I love to hear which one. And I knew you were going to say that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. You know me well. You know me well. So for all of those listening and watching, we are definitely going to put all the information for understand.me in the show notes, as well as Mandy's information. And that'll give you an ability to look at understand.me, get information about the book. Um, this is a topic that I am committed to continue to talk about. So Mandy, you're going to come back and we're going to talk yeah. about this again. Yes. Yeah. From a different, uh, different perspective. Um, but I hope you found this insightful. This is something that I am not only supportive of, but continue to be curious about and use this in my work with my clients um, to try to spread the impact of what these assessments and understand that me can do for teams, for people, for leaders, and really for our, our world. Yeah. So thank you for joining me, Mandy. This thank has been a blast. You. I had so much fun. Thanks for having me. I had a blast too. Thank you. Thanks for all of you for listening or watching. We'll see you next time on the next episode of Finding the Upside.